uh, just wanted to say a few words about the theme of the event. So I, I kind of realized, uh, I realized that it's a, maybe we framed it as a really broad topic. Like if you say uh, alternative to capitalism, that could mean any number of things. And as we know, even to say that we live in a capitalist society can mean just so, so many things. It's just such a broad topic, but um, we kind of what we had in mind for the event and hopefully it's something that can resonate with people and can be useful for people um, is maybe this idea that we're just completely immersed in a society that just assumes transaction. Everything is for sale and everything can be bought. And that's the primary way we just interact with life. That's what we do for a living. That's what we do when we go to the store. That's what we do. Uh, just, uh, you know, for example, I'm a teacher and just the idea that your performance is, uh, is measured by a number and that the, there's this sense of uh, comp competing and a number being assigned to what you are. It's just completely ingrained in the way we operate in the world. And, you know, that's maybe good, maybe bad, but uh, what we wanted to kind of talk about in this event is uh, this sense that living in that society, uh, in a society that just assumes transaction, it, it's not just something we do on the outside, but it actually infiltrates the way we think and the way we live in the world. Um, and so that's also kind of inspired by all the conversations we've been having with Nipun, because I think that he's somebody who has thought very deeply about this. So the question that's driving the event is, uh, if we believe that if we believe that human beings are not just purely transactional and self-directed, uh, which is not a given, like in psychology, I remember there's people who very seriously believe that human beings are uh, selfish by nature and they will always uh, go for self-interest. So, you know, but if, if we believe that maybe that's not all that human beings are, how do you operate in a society that seems to take that for granted? And how do you live according to a different set of values? So hopefully kind of uh, what, uh, what we mean by that will become clear in the event. So now I will uh, stop talking and uh, introduce my speaker. But um, actually, I won't be introducing my speaker. We have a little surprise. We uh, asked Reverend Kang Shur, who's a senior monastic in our community, if he would be uh, willing to introduce Nipun for us, because he is going to do a much better job than I. And he's a, a longtime friend of Nipun. I know they're, they're very close, and he's been an inspiration for him. So he very kindly agreed to introduce Nipun. So uh, here we have the introduction for a speaker, and here it goes. This is Reverend Hengshur uh, introducing Nipun Meta. Hi, my name is Hengshur. I'm lucky today because I get to introduce you to a special person. Uh, his name is Nipun Meta. He uh, grew up in Silicon Valley, and I'll give you the the uh, highlights at the top, and then tell you a bit about Nipun. He is the co-founder of an organization called Service Space, and Service Space defines itself as an incubator of projects that support a gift culture. When he was in his mid twenties, Nipun quit his job to become a full-time volunteer. And over the last 15 years, his work has reached millions, including over 500,000, that's half a million volunteers who have been inspired by service base to take part in the projects. President Obama appointed him on a council for social change. The Dalai Lama recognized him as an unsung hero of compassion. Germany's Um magazine named him to the top 100 Most Inspiring People of 2018. He's addressed thousands of gatherings around the world, no exaggeration, literally thousands of gatherings, speaking next to range, range, wide-ranging social leaders such as Woz, Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple, author Elizabeth Gilbert, civil rights legend John Lewis. He's been awarded the Jefferson Award for Public Service, the President's Volunteer Service Award, Wavy Gravy, America's Most Notorious Clown, Humanitarian Award. 
Nipun serves on advisory boards of the Seva Foundation, the Dalai Lama Foundation, and the Greater Good Science Center. Service Space, his organization has created so far, Charity Focus, KindSpring.org, DailyGood.org, KarmaTube.org, iJourney, Awaken, Pledge Page, CF Sites, Karma Kitchen, Pro Poor. At last count, I found seven TED Talks on YouTube by Nipun. Are you impressed yet? Uh, he grew up in Santa Clara, and he considered becoming a tennis pro. While he was in junior college, he won trophies in state and regional tennis tournaments. It was a possibility. Uh, in the college, junior college, uh, in order to, to give more time to his tennis game, he took 40 credits in a semester where 12 was standard so that he could uh, improve his tennis game. <laughs> uh, he, when he got to Evans Hall at UC Berkeley, he double majored in philosophy and computer science. Nipun travels through his day looking for opportunities to give. I've seen him receive an honorarium for a talk and then turn around and hand it to the cab driver that's taking him to the airport. Um, I know for a fact that uh, he and his wife, Guri, were first married by Mount Shasta. There's a story there. He was more formally married again at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery by a panel of officiants from eight religious traditions, including a priest, a monk, a nun from the Jain tradition, a rabbi, a pastor, and an atheist. Then, talk about how unusual this man whom you're going to be hearing from is. For the wedding banquet, he piled all the wedding guests into a bus and drove them to the city of 10,000 Buddhas, where the newlyweds first made offerings to the Sangha, then treated everybody to a dinner at the Junkang restaurant. Unusual. Uh, he and his new bride, for a honeymoon, walked 1,000 kilometers through India on $1 a day. Uh, this was an unopen, un unscripted, open-ended pilgrimage to, as Nipun and Guri said, to use our hands to do random acts of kindness, to use our heads to profile inspiring people whom they met, and to use our hearts to cultivate truth. Uh, living on a dollar a day doesn't go very far, even in India. And they ate where food was offered, they slept wherever they could find a flat surface, and uh, ended up at a monastery where they meditated for three months. Uh, Nipun still makes chai for Guri in the mornings, and for over a decade, he hand-carried the food that she cooked for the monks at the monastery a mile across the city of Berkeley. He meditates with his parents, and I have, uh, when I was resting before a talk I gave at their home, I had a chance to rest in Nipun's room, and it's empty. He truly knows how to give. And his mind is at a level that cycles in a way that they've had to create new vocabularies to encapsulate the vision that he commands. Social capital, giftivism, gift economy, generosity entrepreneurs, compassion laboratories, laddership. Uh, Nipun still spends one third of his time coding uh, at the computer, he calls it the plumbing of their ecosystem. He has a fertile mind, he's open to innovation, and he comes alive in dialogue with other open hearts. So I invite you to challenge him because we haven't seen the heights that his wisdom can reach. There's more to come. I introduce you to Nipun Metta. Okay, so that's uh, our introduction. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Can I just say, wow? <laughs> I mean, what a treat, what an honor, uh, and, and what a blessing. Um, and whoever thought of this uh, to actually bug him from the thousand things he has to do uh, to, to do a little intro for me. Uh, thank you to that person, because uh, that was a very precious act of kindness you did for me. Thank you. Uh, we're very happy that uh, you appreciate it, and hopefully, hopefully, everybody can also uh, kind of bask in the in the obvious uh, 
connection that that is there. Um, okay, so that we wanted to start this event. The first question, Nipun, that I wanted to ask you is: um, so, as as Reverend Hengshir mentioned, uh, you became a volunteer. You haven't charged for your labor for uh, is it fifteen years or twenty years? For about twenty years. Um, so the kind of the two questions that I wanted to start with is uh, first, uh, what what made you uh, what process kind of led you to that decision? Why did Young Nipun uh, decided to make this shift from the uh, tech sector to uh, uh, not charging for his labor? And uh, how how does it even how does it even work? How does it even <laughs> like a thing? Yeah. Well, thank you uh, for that question, Omar. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, how, how did it start? I would have to say it was an accident. Uh, I don't think I decided that, oh, you know, I'm going to go and like now I'm going to live like this because I have this idea of living like that. Uh, I think it was an accident for me uh, in the sense um, that I think I was always curious and I was always experimenting. Uh, and because I was experimenting, when you find something good, you're like, I want to do more of it. You know, I was just recently, one of my friend's uh, wives uh, just passed away. Uh, but this uh, gentleman, his name is Jacob Needleman. He's a remarkable elder in the Gurdjieff tradition. Uh, he's written, I, I don't know, over something like 19 books, maybe. Um, just a great thought leader, a great yeah, wisdom yeah, elder. Sorry. Uh, and he has this one very in, amazing story. He said he asked his class one time, um, how, how do you, where have you learned how to be good? And so everyone goes and they, you know, they figure out like, you know, they all share their reflections. And one guy says, I learned how to be good for my four-year-old. And everyone's like, wait, four-year-old? How did you learn from your four-year-old? He says, well, you know, we are at Christmas. I just given him gifts. Um, the night before on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day, he says, we're from Mexico. We were spending it with family in, um, in Mexico. And, and a kid from the neighborhood slums walks by, comes to the front door. And I wanted to teach my son how to give. And so I said, you know, son, you got so many toys. Why don't you give him one of your toys? And, and so he goes and he gives, uh, you know, initially he's like throwing a tantrum. He's like, no, no, I just got these. I want to keep these, all this. And then he like, he finally lets, he's like, okay, I'm, my dad's serious. Like I better pick one, you know? And, and so he's like, and he's an enterprising kid. So he picked his least favorite toy um, and he goes and he's about to go. And dad looks at him and he's like, son, not that toy. Give him your favorite toy. And well, you know, he was totally not ready for that. And when he's, you know, but he looks at his, at his father and I kind of see it as like the Simba Mufasa moment, you know, where he, he like looks at his dad and he's like, oh, my dad's serious. I better do it. And he does it. Uh, and so he takes his favorite toy and he's about to go out and give it. And, and, and when he comes back, his father is thinking, I should promise him all these things. I should get him the same toy again, all these sorts of things. Um, but lo and behold, to his surprise, this kid is coming back with a giant smile on his face. He's just giving away his favorite toy. He's coming back with a giant smile on his face and he looks his dad in the eye and he says, dad, that was amazing. Can I do it again? And I would say that that's sort of my journey, right? Like I, I through whatever accident, it wasn't my dad telling me to do it, you know, but it was like I experimented with generosity. I experimented with selfishness too. And I found it pretty hollow. And so I said, well, all right, well, let's try the other way. Let's actually try giving. And as I did it, I was like, I want to do more. Like, this is amazing. Like, why is this like the best kept secret? Or like, why do you, why do people tell you you have to be like 65 and retire and then you give? I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, I'm in my early 20s and I'm, I just want to keep giving as much as I can. And so I started by like giving you know, initially I was, you know, out of college, even in college, I was doing lots of different things for the community. But as I got out, I was working and I, I was getting paid uh, for this, you know, for this job I had. I was optimizing C++ compilers at Sun Microsystems. Um, and I would take, well, yeah, I needed very few things. And uh, so I was like, well, what I could save all this for like when I'm 65, or, but I could just give it, you know, and that gave me so much joy. And so I would give it. 
And as I started giving, I was like, oh, this is really good. You know, this is great. I think I found a loophole into this whole cycle of suffering, you know? And so I was like, okay, I, I think I want to give more. And at some point I had only so much money, you know? And so, okay, you finish your money. What do you do? Like, well, what else can I give? You know, you're kind of looking around. And I was like, well, I could give, maybe I could give uh, some, you know, I could give my time. And and then I, I gave as much time as I had, like, all, you know, I had no extra time. Um, and so then I was like, really, what, what else can I give? And I said, I just want to give myself, because it just felt so right. So I was like, I just had that feeling in my heart. Now, of course, I can't give myself in, I mean, what else can you do outside of time and your material resources, but I just had that feeling in myself, which was much deeper than, oh, I'm helping. It was almost like I'm offering. So you move from seeing the world as like from this top down lens. There's a very beautiful quote by Rachel Naomi Remen. She says, when you help, you see life as weak. I have, you don't have. When you fix, you see life as broken. With, oh, I'm smart. And you know, what do you know? You're in the slums. Let me build you a nice cottage because I have an architecture degree or whatever. You know, there, there's that fixing mentality. And then, and then she says, when you serve, you see life as a co-creative whole, uh, which is so profound. But I, I sort of found that when you go even one step further, that when you offer, you almost feel grateful that you have a chance to give. So I was like, uh, you know, I would be going around and I'd be like giving and I was like, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I felt like I was on the, I, I was on the luckier end of that stick, you know? And so uh, then I, then it's just a matter of arranging your life and saying, well, how can I orient? How can I bring this inner orientation of generosity of others first, your ego second, uh, how can you bring this in more and more ways, in creative ways, uh, in collective ways? How do you show? How do you how do you express that impulse? How do you help others express that impulse? And how do you do that collectively? You know that, and that sort of has become you know the work of my last few decades. Um, so, but yeah, to your to your question, I think I would, if I was being honest, I would have to say it was an accident. You know, <laughs> and in my case, my dad didn't even tell me you have to go give your favorite toy. My dad almost had to do the opposite. He's like, okay, stop now. Now you've already given away all your favorite toys. Like, you know, keep at least one some for you. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, no. My my parents also, of course, are very very supportive. But yeah, um, that's that's been my journey. Well, thank you so much uh, for sharing that. That's uh, such an inspiring story. And uh, it's, uh, it brings me a lot of warmth to just, just hear that. And uh, I guess kind of when I, hear you, when I hear you speak, everything you say just resonates. Like it just feels right. And at the same time, it feels like uh, such a... Uh, like an outlier it's like and so that's why kind of my second part of the question is how does this even work and the reason I was asking that is you know because myself or you know I have also talked about this with friends um, we kind of know I think that everybody kind of knows that that being selfish is not very good and we never feel so good about it but it it <sighs> It just feels like, like for example, I was talking with my friend about this, and he he just took a, a a job that he that he really dislikes, and he's you know he's doing marketing for Coca Cola and things like that, and uh, and he like he 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 knows that's not what he wants to do with his life, but it's like it seems like if it feels like if if he didn't do this then he wouldn't have anything to eat like that's the, there's maybe like a fear mindset or like a kind of uh, like yes this sounds great but i couldn't do it i, I would just starve or uh, like there's no way so there seems like for me if i think about this there seems to be like a kind of barrier to that so maybe kind of i was wondering if you could speak to that in whether in your case was there did you ever struggle with a the kind of fear uh, it seems like a lot of our behavior is driven by this fear or uh, 
Could you speak about that in your own experience? Well, oh, yeah. I mean, I had lots of fear. I mean, I would say I probably still have lots of fear that is to be unpacked. I mean, and that's an ongoing journey. Uh, and I think if you see that as an opportunity, then if, if you see that as an opportunity to cultivate, then it makes sense to be on that kind of a path, you know, but yeah, like, you know, I, I remember when I quit my job, I have, I've only had one job uh, for my third year of college. I was where I, I got this one job and I, I did that for a few years uh, and that was it. But I remember when I quit, my boss was like, are you unhappy? We'll give you more money. And I was like, no, it's uh, I'm just hearing a different drum, you know, and there he was like, what are you go Where are you going to go? And I, I'm sure in his mind, he's thinking, OK, this guy wants to it's like a new skateboard you find and then you want to go play with it and then you'll come back, you know. Uh, but I knew what was going on in my heart. And then I packed up all my stuff and, and you know, I, I, I took it one last time. I'd, I'd given away my badge and all that. And I knew I couldn't go back. And, and I, I put that in my trunk and I, I was like, you know, I mean, actually, the 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 real story is there. There was a Eminem song playing in the background on my radio, which uh, I I don't know if it's in keeping to bring Eminem up in, um, you know, in a in, in a DRV circle. But uh, there was a song. Eminem's a rapper, and, and he has this song. He says, "Will will the real Slim Shady please stand up? Please stand up? Please stand up?" And it's a and I, I, it just so happened that I was turning on my car and I had this music play. It was a radio station and the song was playing. And I was telling myself, will the real Nipun Mehta please stand up? Please stand up. Please stand up. And as soon as I said that, I just started crying. And it was like, I'm jumping. And I have no idea that if a net will appear. And I didn't know anybody who had done this. Everybody around me thought it was a little bit crazy. <laughs> um, and, and there was this sense. And, and of course, there was some sense that, okay, maybe I can always get another job later down the road kind of thing. And it was an experiment. I just saw it as an experiment. But there's this fear, you know. And, and then over time, as I, you know, as I managed uh, to continue on this path, there's also societal kind of pressures that come in. You know, people saying, oh, aren't you supposed to be like, or are you living off of your parents? Or are you like, you know, shouldn't you be taking care of them instead of that? I was like, why don't you talk to my parents, see what they think? Am I taking care of them or am I not, you know? Um, but there's, you know, and, and then you go to gatherings and people are like, what do you do? And I'm like, I volunteer. And they're like, no, what do you really do? And I'm like, no, I really volunteer. <laughs> And, and, and they just, they're like, okay, fine. A crazy guy, next person, you know, like you don't get that kind of respect. Like if you were to say, oh, I'm a, I'm a such and such a working at such and such company and doing X, Y, Z things in the world. And all of it, it's like, oh, okay, let me see if this guy's interesting. But this is like, and, and, and even those who are like, oh, he's a nice guy. I'll talk to him. And then you're, they learn and they're like, Oh, service space sounds very interesting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, how, what, like, how many staff do you have? And I'm like, oh, we're volunteer run. And then they find out we don't fundraise. And they're like, oh, so this is like a lemonade stand, you know? <laughs> so it's almost like, oh, I'm talking to a kid, you know? So, and I would have so many people who, who, who felt kind of connected to me. They felt connected to these values. But they just thought that everything you're doing is so everything I was doing is so childish. Everything I was doing is so like, you know, it's like so utopian. It's like, oh, tell us when you grow up, you know, and yeah, tell, you know, and they thought, OK, service space is doing this, uh, you know, and sooner or later it's going to need some money and then you're going to be back in the same mix. And so um, people people would say that. And, 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 you know, so that's tough. Right. Like that's. Constantly, you feel like an outsider. You feel like it, it's already tough dealing with your inner stuff and then to deal with social stuff and then to have people just kind of look at your work uh, and say, oh, well, that's not real stuff because it doesn't work on them in the market economy. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that, that was a continual uh, sort of struggle. Um, but what helped me to stay on I think was my intrinsic uh, experience of generosity, where you, you know, it's like, it's like that kid, that four-year-old, you give and you, and, and now there's a ton of science. I mean, it's like your oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, endorphins, all this goes up in the simplest act of 
you know, it's like eating 20,000 chocolate bars. I think that's what one scientist kind of put it as like chocolate gives you a high too. That's why we all love chocolate. I love it too. Um, but it, it gives you a high, uh, it, but giving gives you even a greater high. Um, and this guy, I think Paul Piff, a uh, researcher, I believe at Davis, you know, he did this experiment where he said, well, you can go buy stuff at the mall with this money or you can give it and your body rewards you way more if you're giving it. Um, so it's, it's not like, you know, it's not something that like some monks in the Himalayas have discovered and like it's, it's very real. It's very <laughs> under scrutiny for all of us. Generosity is actually its own reward. So for me, I think there were these external challenges, even some internal challenges, but there was this inner experience. And when you look at the opportunity and the cost, right? Like a good business person will always do an opportunity cost analysis. Like what's the cost and is opportunity worth more than the cost? And for me, it was just so clear. It was like, man, it's like, okay, the cost is you're gonna have some of these internal demons plague you, some of these external societal things, all of that. And man, the reward is like, wow, ridiculous. And so, yeah, I'm going to go for the 20,000 chocolate bars. And so what? Like, what do you do? I, I volunteer. Fine. Go ahead. You know, if you want to laugh at it, go ahead. Like, if you want to think it's like silly and childish and that someday I will, I will grow up. Well, okay. And maybe I will. I was even humble about it. I was like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, you know, I, this is even to my logical mind. I was like, I don't really know. I always framed it as an experiment. So it was light. It was like, yeah, I mean, even now, if I have to go get a job tomorrow, I don't mind. Uh, if my parents get really sick and they don't have insurance or something, I'll go get a job tomorrow. Uh, but what I've learned is not so much like how your bank balance, you know, coordinates with your needs, what I've learned is actually a much subtler and deeper principle uh, around this, you know, around generosity and, the, and how generosity is a gateway to just building noble friendships and affinities and also a uh, gateway into, in, into just into cultivation uh, and wisdom. Um, so for me, uh, it's, it feels like a gold mine. Um, so e even if I couldn't give in the same ways, I would never I, I, it would be very silly to give up my inner orientation of service, inner orientation of generosity. So I wouldn't do that. Um, it just sounds very um, self-defeating. Yeah, so um, actually that's kind of uh, where it leads to, right? At the end, uh, this kind of inner orientation that you're uh, so eloquently talking about and that you have so obviously explored in your own life. And uh, I guess that's kind of where I wanted to go with the next question is uh, this uh, thing that we were also talking about last time we spoke about this. Uh, maybe I don't I don't want to frame it in a kind of one thing is better than the other or like, you know, like uh, a kind of uh, we have to argue about it or something. But um, this idea that um, I think we have become very used to being very transactional in the way that we we exist, and I think that's what you were bringing up last time as the something that really struck me what you were saying. And just now you were mentioning this kind of inner orientation that seems to come from a completely different place. And I think we can all relate to that. I think we all know the difference between when we do that kind of active generosity. It it just feels very different from uh, when we are thinking about what we're going to get in return. But I think what really struck me last time we spoke is that um, this, uh, what you mentioned that because you've done this for so long, you've kind of um, become a little bit, I, I, I don't want to quote, misquote you, please correct me, but you've become very used to not seeing things through that lens of transaction. And you were mentioning that you feel like your mind, your way of looking at the world has changed from this just kind of being in this internal orientation. So I was wondering if you could uh, speak a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thank, that's a great question. I think it's very relevant for all of us, you know, to say, so when you engage in transaction, fundamentally, what are you doing? Um, you are saying you're engaging in, in direct reciprocity. I give this to you, you give this back to me. Uh, and it's a trade, it's a transaction. Um, 
But the problem with that is, uh, is that it's a very narrow view uh, of what's possible between two people. And even fundamentally, it's a very narrow view of who you are. So if you are strictly limited to your outer experience, you're naturally going to think it's a zero sum game. How am I going to survive? And you, you work on this principle of direct reciprocity. But over time, you can experiment and explore and realize that you can actually go one step further and try indirect reciprocity. Indirect reciprocity is I give to Brenda, Brenda gives to Steve, Steve gives to Jen, Jen gives to Omar. And when you do that, what you have is like every, and, and, and then Jen may give to me, you know? And so we all are engaged in give and take, but it's not direct reciprocity. Um, so think of everyone, I, I usually, like when I give a presentation, I have this one image of all these like young kids si sitting in a circle of like kindergarten and everyone giving a back rub to the person in front of them, you know? And so it's not like I go to a salon and say, you do this for me and I give something back to you. It's like, I do it for the person in front of me and what goes around sort of comes around. Uh, and what you get there is not just that everyone's needs are met, what you get is the circle. So it's so like at Karma Kitchen, you know, this is an experiment that we've done uh, in, in so many countries around the world where you walk in and your check reads zero uh, and volunteers are running this restaurant. But the reason why your check reads zero is because someone before you has paid for you and you are trusted to pay forward whatever you want for people after you. And everyone comes in and they're like so wowed by the concept and they're like, wow, this is amazing. You know, I think at one point when we, we started in Berkeley and I think at one point it was like the top rated right restaurant on Yelp across all of Berkeley. And it was like, and we'd have huge waiting lists of people like waiting to come in and there was just this energy and, and people would always be curious. So how is it working out? Do people give? You know, do people give more, less, all that? And we're like, we don't even measure that, right? We look at the total at the end of the end, end of a certain day, and we always ended up uh, having a surplus. But I was like, that's really actually the wrong question, because our question isn't to break even. Our question isn't even to make a surplus. Like, what are you going to do with that? The whole purpose of this was actually to ignite new value that is created when we all come together in a circle. Right? That instead of just me and you doing this thing, I, you know, I go to a hair salon. <laughs> I, of all things, I'm choosing hair salon as my <laughs> example as a bald man. Um, but I go to a hair salon and I say, you know, here's my, you know, here, here, here's my 20 bucks. You give me this haircut. And it's like, you know, it's a transaction. There isn't a communal possibility. But when you do this in a collective way, there's a deeper possibility. But, it's, but then you can go one step further, right? So this is where you go from direct reciprocity, which is transaction, to indirect reciprocity, which is relational. But then you can go to infinite reciprocity. And infinite reciprocity says that we are anyways bound up together in this web of life. So if I do something for you and I never see you again, I never interact with you in this way, shape or form again, it's okay because wherever you go, wherever you pay it forward, that's also the field of consciousness. That's also me. And so then you become very principled in your generosity. And then you are bound, then you operate from a space of infinite reciprocity. And that's what I would think of as like a kingly giver, right? Not a, not a giver that's like Beggarly giver is a transactional, even in giving, you can be transactional, right? Like so many people, even, even when they donate money, they're like, well, I want this in return. How are you using the money? All this stuff. And it, it's like, that's like a beggarly giving. And then there's a kind of neighborly giving where you give and you're like, okay, I'm going to give you sugar because you need help. And may, maybe it'll come back to me because it's security for me, you know, but then there's kingly giving. And kingly giving is like people who have understood infinite reciprocity. And they're like, I am giving the way a rose gives its scent. Not in a transactional way. A rose gives, it's not asking, oh, I like you, or, you know, I like, I like people who look like this, or I like, people. it's like rose is giving because it is in its nature. And so you start giving, you start behaving in a moral, ethical way, because that is in your nature, you know, and, 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 and that becomes 
uh, a way forward. So I think over time, uh, it's and we of course our society has built systems around transactions. I mean, it's the lowest common denominator. It's like the cheapest thing two people can do is transact, and we have created systems assuming the cheapest possibility of you know um, uh, between of an interaction. Um, but how do you elevate that? And what are the systems that nurture that? What are the external systems, but also what are the internal systems that we can cultivate? What are the external, what is the external architecture that keeps you transactional? And what are the internal, what are the internal architectures that do that? And how do we dismantle them in a gentle, compassionate way so that we can arrive at a much deeper sense of who we are, deeper sense of who the other person is, deeper sense of our connection, and a much deeper sense of what's possible between the two of us, you know, and, and, and not just two, between all of us. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I think we are primed for transactions, but I think actually we can, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of experimenting. And so I would encourage you to just try. My parents are great examples of this. You know, they, they host these awaken circles so like pre pandemic for, I think 24 years or something like that. Now, maybe now 25 years and every, uh, Wednesday in our house, you know, like people come in, they sit in silence for an hour. There's no teacher, no organization, nothing. It's just a home. Uh, second hour, there's a circle of sharing. And third hour, my mom and dad, and usually me and whoever else uh, would spend the day cooking for all these 50, 60 people that have come. And, and at the end, invariably, people would come and say thank you. I mean, this is, this is every single week, right? Like for 25 years is a long time. And like someone calculated it, this is probably even in the first 15 or 18 years, someone's like, oh, you, my, my mom would have fed 50,000 people. And that's, that's true, it's like even more. But what's inspiring is not that, like that's great. And the fact that Awaken Circles have gone to so many circles around the world, that's great. But what's really inspiring is that when you go and thank them and say, auntie, uncle, thank you for hosting me. This has been so meaningful, we really appreciate it. It, and they said, can I, how can I give back? And my parents would say, oh, just pay it forward. Do something for someone else somewhere in the world. And it's one thing to do it, you know, one week, five, you know, five weeks, 10 weeks, like, you know, but to do it for, for decades in that spirit is really profound. And what's profound about it is not the external ripple effects because who can even count and measure that? What's really profound is how they are different now. So if you were to go in and ask them, would you wanna do, put in so much sweat and toil, do it for no, transa no, no transactional value whatsoever, right? Like even in your time of need, you don't know that they don't even know most of the people that come, they don't even keep track, like nothing. And they give the best of what they have, you know, even in terms of the food, even in terms of what my mom cooks, it's like, it's what we would have, you know, and, and it's like, you, you'd say, well, what's the, would you, would you do it again in a heartbeat? Right. They would be like, oh, of course, infinite reciprocity. The biggest winner of infinite reciprocity is the giver itself. It's like, man, I'm so lucky. I got a chance to give. And, and so this is like a very, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very lived, very real um, for people who uh, experiment with it. So after that, you're like transaction. Yeah, I could go back to dial up internet and dial, call in on Zoom, but that's probably, you know, it's like, man, I got 5G. That's good, man. This is what I want. So this is the 5G connection of life. Uh, so you would never, once you've tasted 5G, you're not going back to dial up. Here. <laughs> so that's, that's how I look at it. That's a, uh, that's a, a very, uh, very good analogy. Uh, I just want to remind people that if you have any questions that you would like to bring up to Nipun, just please uh, type them in the chat. We'll, be, we'll have a few minutes at the end to bring up uh, questions from people. Uh, so you can, you can uh, type them now or we can open the space later. And, but for now, Nipun, I wanted to ask you uh, another question that came up when I was listening to you. And it's the, so when, 
um, one of the words that I've heard uh, that you've used and that's been used to describe what you do is this idea of giftivism. So everything that I'm hearing you say, I think uh, it's a kind of paradigm shift. I think that when I hear you speak about everything you're saying, it's kind of like relating to life in a different way. So kind of what I, what I wanted to say is with this idea of giftivism, which implies the kind of the giving the service, but also the activism meaning, which I understand as trying to have an impact in society or trying to change things or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So do you, do you see these ideas that you have explored in your own life as a way of uh, changing the way society works or I don't, I don't want to yeah. put words, but uh, to have an impact on, 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 on the wider society. I, I mean, I, I, th I think you absolutely want to have, uh, it, you know, you, it, it's not that you want to have impact on a wider society. I think our every breath is having an impact on the wider society. You can't help it. Now the question is what kind of impact do you want to create in the world? And I think if you create, if you act from this space where you are othering, where it's, this is me and this is you and I'm right and you are wrong. I'm gifted and you are not. I am uh, educated and you are not. I am rich and you are not. Like if you, if you operate from that perspective, I think we're adding to the noise in the world. Um, I th it, but if we operate from this perspective of a much deeper space of like, Hey, I'm offering, I'm actually receiving a lot. Thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you for the opportunity to explore the synergy between you and I. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to actually dissolve my ego. Like the smallest act of kindness we do, right? It's, it's really worth uh, looking at the inner experience of a small act of kindness. I think people are always looking at the external ripple effect. Like what impact did this have? Like, as if, like, what do you want, a certificate on your deathbed? Like, okay, I, I touched like 8 million people. Like, what? It, 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 that's not what you want. I mean, you could think that, okay, then it was a life well lived, but I think that's an untested hypothesis because we've never actually asked those guys afterwards and be like, oh, you died, you passed away, and you affected 8 million people. Uh, how was your experience? What really mattered? And most of those who have near death experiences will tell you what really mattered is what was in your heart, you know, uh, how you were operating in, in, you know, as you did these small uh, acts of kindness. So I think it's very helpful to see actually what happens in a small act. So when we do a small act, what's the inner ripple effect? We know the outer ripple effect, right? Like you can, even if you think you're going to create external impact, you're, you're going out creating that. But what happens on the inside? You're on the inside, you start to shift so even even in a small way from me to we you start you put the brakes on the ego even momentarily right and as you put the brakes on the ego the mind quiets down and as the mind quiets down it falls into a deep interconnectedness and as it falls into this interconnectedness you are a lot more satisfied so your needs go down your simplicity is starts arising because you're not seeking uh, you know, you're not compensating for your inner angst by shopping or by external stuff or forget even material things by like dominating other people like power dynamics, you know, that we all have that really points to an inner angst and that inner angst is there because you're not connected. You're not connected because you're too much in the me. And so this small act of kindness is actually creating this incredible inner ripple effect. So when you, when you weigh these two and you say, wow, like, oh, there was an outer thing, but there's also an inner thing. And when you honor the inner, then how do you act? Right? You would act in a way that does not other, that does not create boundaries, that is not short-sighted. And then you no longer, it's like you don't go to a peace, a peace rally with anger. And a lot of people think it's like, that's fine. Like you, you, you do that because that's required because you know, that's how you shake these people up. Uh, but you know, the Jesus is of the world and the Buddhas of the world and the Muhammad's of the world have lived and, and gone and we still have a lot of suffering. Maybe it's the wrong question to ask. So it's, you certainly want to, I mean, certainly my life is about external service uh, as much as it is about inner cultivation, but where they come together, I think is a very, 
uh, is a is this idea of giftivism, or you know, some of us now call it heartivism, where you oppose without you oppose the action, maybe if it's not an appropriate action, but you love the person. And this is something that Gandhi Gandhi was a huge example of. He did something unprecedented in the world. Um, and even, even in South Africa, before India, he led this giant movement. And the head of the military in South Africa, like even now when you go to South Africa, you can see this in the museums. They, he jails Gandhi. And what does Gandhi do? He has no hatred towards him. He's like, I oppose this action. But you are all love, man. The, your, your core nature is all love. So this is just a little misguided action. So I'm going to oppose that action, but I love you. So he puts him in jail. Go, he has to go through all these different trials and tribulations. But while he's there, he makes shoes by hand for his arch rival. And this guy, at the end of their fight, he says, it was my honor to lose, to have Gandhi as my antagonist to have Gandhi as my opponent. And he says, to this day, I have never found it in me to actually put my feet in those venerable shoes, that venerable gift. This is his opponent, General Schmutz, like saying, like, oh man, what an honor to lose to you. So who do we have to be to, to engage in the world in a way where we're able to delineate between like the person and that one action where you're able to hold that gentle action like a grandpa does with the child, right? Oh, that, that's silly. You shouldn't do that. And sometimes you do it in a strong way. But underneath it, you're like, oh, man, he's my grandchild. Like, of course, I love him, you know? Like, can we do that? Um, and, and so I think it's, a, and a lot of it will, is dependent on how aware we are of our inner ripple effect. So once we're aware of that inner ripple effect uh, and you have a heart of compassion, that will naturally translate into external action, but that external action will have a very different flavor. Um, and we don't really have a word for that, you know? And so I, you know, long back we were like, okay, let's call it giftivism or, you know, we you know, kind of make up words. It doesn't really matter what you call it. Uh, but uh, like, that's, that's a very different flavor than like, oh, you, you are wrong and I'm gonna show you that you're wrong, um, you know, versus, versus actually elevating all sides both sides of the rope in the tug of war. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I, I actually feel like we've just uh, only started the conversation. I feel like we could go for many more hours um, and I have so many more questions, but uh, actually we are nearing the end of our time. So we, we have a couple of questions in the chat and uh, if anybody has any more questions, you're welcome to type them. So we're, I'm gonna pass the mic to Brenda so she can uh, go to the questions in the chat. But it was, uh, it was an honor to, to have this opportunity to talk to you, Nipun, and hopefully we can continue our conversation in the future because it there's definitely uh, so much, uh, so much um, to share with you. And so it's so enjoyable. Thank you. So I'll give the mic to Brenda. Thanks, Omar. Yeah, we have a couple questions now. And um, this first one from Vishnu is, I think, really falls along with what you've been talking about, Nipun. Um, so Vishnu asks, how do you practice giving when you know that is true to your heart from early on, but ego or a fear of being hurt or being left alone always comes? Can you share a little bit um, on this? Yeah, um, I, I I think that's a that's a real fear. Um, that man, if I if I'm just giving, I'll be left with nothing. If I'm just serving other people, no one will care for me. Um, and and what I have experienced, I, I would have those fears too. Uh, but what I experienced is the very counterintuitive thing that actually that fear. It, it's like, uh, it's just my wife says, has this phrase, monster is under the bed, you know? It's like, there's, it's, you've never really looked there. And so you just kind of assume. And when you assume, you, you're, you're, you keep going in these cycles of, of doubt and fear, and it just multiplies. Um, but when you actually look, you realize that it is impossible to do even the smallest act of kindness. And this is true even from my experience. As you give, and especially as you give with this inner emptiness, it's, it's the law of nature to, to, to create a bond, to create an affinity. And when you create these affinities, you are held up 
in this incredible web. I mean, the metaphor that I always think of is that when you fall down and invariably we're gonna fall down, it's if you fall down on a concrete slab, it's gonna hurt a lot. But if you fall down on a trampoline, you're gonna bounce back even higher. And that trampoline, the web of that trampoline is made through these affinities. And those affinities are seeded through each act of service. So it's actually when we go and let's say I was transactional with you and we were business partners and then we got into a fight and then we are like separated and all this stuff, like that kind of connection, even though we might've spent 10 years together is not nearly as deep as if we served others together. And so if you serve others together, you actually create the foundation of your resiliency. I think the core of your question is really about resiliency. Like how do you, you know, they, as they say, a saint is not a person that never falls down. A saint is a person that falls down 99 times, but gets up a hundred times. And so the question really is uh, how do we make sure that we get the trampoline? And I think the trampoline is afforded to us precisely by these acts of kindness, of generosity, of offering without any agenda whatsoever. And, and, and so in a weird sort of a way, what's keeping us from it is precisely like, it, it, it's like, that's exactly the thing that the antidote is. I, I, I'm sure there's a powerful metaphor for that. I don't know if that's clear, but it's like, it's a, we're, we're afraid. And because of that fear, we're not giving. And because we don't give, it creates a vicious cycle that we actually get more afraid and we don't give even more. And that isolates us more and more and more. Whereas this is a virtuous cycle where you give, with giving you have, you have these deep affinities. And as you have these deep affinities, you are even more secure. You feel, you feel like you can give even more. Uh, and it's just a virtuous cycle. So I would say, you know, experiment, go try it. Like that fear itself is keeping you out. And so see if you can, you know, um, and what I used to do is I would, whenever I feel like people are, uh, you know, offering solid stuff, uh, as in if there's a kind of no nobleness to it, even if I get a feeling, I would be like, oh, let me go help you. Even if I was, I remember I was at a conference like many, many years ago, and I saw this guy and he was like a, you know, Native American uh, tribal leader. And I, he spoke and I was like, oh, there's something substantial here in his spirit. And uh, I, I, right afterwards, we were all going to the lunch hall. And as we were going, I was like, I want to serve. Uh, what can I do? I don't know. And so I'm like just one person. And I don't, it's not like I'm a philanthropist or whatever. I don't, I don't know what I can do. So I went and I said, can I just, you know, we're, you're going to lunch, you know, chief, can I, or carry your bag? And so I just carried his bag, you know, um, and I've never seen him again. But the point is that as I did that, I actually created one more strand in my trampoline. Um, so it's a, it's a very powerful, so I would say go out and do that. Like the moment you are inspired to give for whatever reason, if your heart speaks out, like don't hold back, be like, oh. And it's like, don't, it's, it, this is precisely the antidote for the fear. Thanks, Nguyen. Yeah, I love the kind of the idea of like just experimenting with it. Cause for sure, like I, I have like more of like a black and white idea of things sometimes like if you just do it like somehow you're just going to fall down a hole and like can't get back up but it really is like you can start in little bits and pieces yeah um so we also have something from sanju who says first of all thank you for sharing your wonderful journey and she would love to hear more about your walking pilgrimage across India, which I know that probably could be like a whole, we could do a whole event on you talking about that. Um, but maybe there's a couple of like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and, and it's actually related to this because the, the principle was that you want to overcome that fear um, because you're like insecure. Where am I going to eat? Where am I going to, you know? And, and, you know, it is certainly true. I think it's the law of nature, not just the outer world, that in, you give an inch and nature is going to give you a foot. Like this is, this is true, but we have so many clouds in between um, that sometimes you have to suffer through as you, as you give an inch, you're not getting anything in return. And you're like, okay, but you need an orientation to frame that suffering, right? So you need to have that inner uh, inner architecture, inner strength, uh, the conditions have to be right for you to cultivate. 
And then when you cultivate, you're like, okay, like, okay, suffering has come my way and, and food has not like, you know, uh, or lodging has not. And so we yeah, got my wife and I went on this walking pilgrimage in 2005, right after we got married, as Reverend Hankshire said. And uh, we, we had a dollar between us, which is 50 cents, which is mostly enough just for toiletries, you know. Um, and so we're reliant completely on the kindness of strangers. But the principle was that, you know, sometimes people are mean and people, all kinds of things. Like we went through a whole lot of things. And sometimes I would get upset. My ego would get beat up every day. It's like my ego is getting beat to a pulp, you know? <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, rise again, rise again. Um, and, you know, the big shift, I would say, if I had to just put it in one uh, sentence, it would be that before, the, before and during the pilgrimage, I was like, why can't the world be a little kinder? And I think towards the end, I realized I want to be kinder for the world that you be that change, you know, why don't you try to be unconditionally kind? And you're like, oh, that's kind of hard. Well, then why are you expecting others to do it? You know, just cut them some slack. Like, and when, when you have that orientation, it's such a gentle way to hold people. It's like, yeah, maybe this person's having a bad day, you know, like maybe this person's going through a lot. And, and we had many of those things. And it's like, that's how I encounter them. Uh, but underneath it, it was also this tremendous, uh, I remember sitting a meditation retreat right after, like literally that's where we ended. Um, and it was the most powerful meditation retreat I've ever sat. And I've sat a lot since then. <laughs> so it was like, and I don't know what happened. And then as I look back, I, I know exactly what happened that in my life, um, see, I, I look at you, Brenda, and I say, okay, this is Brenda. I have seen her before. This is Omar. I have seen her before. You look at me and you're like, oh, this is Nipun, you know? And there's a sense of clinging to that permanency. But for us, for us on a pilgrimage, it was like every day, everything was changing. It's like, you might have fed me and I want to hold on to you. And I'm like, ah, you know, tomorrow you're like my best friend. Like, I want to be, you know, connected to you forever. And then it changed. You're like walking and it's changing. It's changing every single day, every single day. So in our external world, even through all our identities and all the charades of the ego, we try to create a fake false sense of permanency, this false solidity that this is solid, this is real, this is continuous, but it's actually not. We have not examined it under the microscope. It is not continuous. Life is not a continuous phenomena at all. And when you do that, and when you put yourself in that situation, it's like, man, my external life was impermanent. And then I sit on the cushion and I'm like, oh, I know this. Like, yeah, this pain that I'm feeling like, yeah, that's totally impermanent because that's that's cool, man. I've been practicing that on the outside for, you know, for so many months. Now I'm sitting on the cushion and there was just this like, like a rootedness. It was like you sit like a mountain and the streams just go through you. And you're no longer identified with the streams, you're identified with the mountain. And the mountain is, you know, in the Buddhist terminology, the four Brahma Viharas, you know. And so that's, that is, that was a very profound uh, change that happened. But yeah, I could tell you stories all night about like the pilgrimage, you know. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for that question. Okay, so uh, we have officially reached the, uh, the end of our allotted time for the event. Uh, we have one, one more question in the chat. Uh, so, you know, if, if you have to go, uh, if, uh, if, if people need to go, then uh, you can do so. Um, but I was wondering, Nipun, if you would be willing to just uh, spend a few more minutes with us to answer this yeah. last question. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So uh, this is officially the event is over. If you need to go, feel free to do so. But if you want to stay uh, just a few more minutes, uh, the last question that we have in the chat is uh, by Melinda. She's asking, can you speak a little bit more about your organization and what it does? <laughs> I, I, I'm not good at answering that because I'm so rooted in my inner uh, world uh, that the outer world just seems like a small ripple effect, you know. Um, we started in 1999 by building websites for nonprofits using volunteers. Um, and then those websites became web portals. 
And so we would run these vertical portals like uh, dailygood.org and you know uh, karmatube.org that Reverend Angshar mentioned, which uh, you know they, they were trying they were like we thought there wasn't enough good news in the world, so we said let's put out a good news email, you know. Uh, and so we started doing that uh, for a few years. Uh, and then we said, well, we should do uh, some offline stuff, you know, place-based stuff, local stuff, like Awaken Circles. They had started much before, but uh, we supported them, Karma Kitchens. Uh, we run like a portal just dedicated to kindness. And we would look at the world and we said, well, what are problems that money can't solve? Because we had capacity and we had infrastructure to do stuff. And we were like, well, we what, what are you going to do with all this capacity? Well, uh, let's solve problems uh, in, the, in the world that create uh, some suffering. Maybe it helps. And so you say, well, which problems am I going to solve? And so we said, let's try to solve problems that money can't solve. And initially, when you think about it, you're like, well, money can solve everything. And you're like, oh, actually, it can't. Um, money's not very good at solving decentralized problems, even to this day, like, you know, everyone knows that trust is going down. Everyone knows inequality is going down. Inequality is ridiculous. You know, in the pandemic, the top 10 richest people in the world uh, made something like $1.3 billion a day. $1.3 billion a day, they were getting richer, while the rest of the 99% was just getting poorer, you know? Um, and so you look at that and it's actually killing one person, inequality and all its ripple effects in healthcare and climate change and hunger is actually killing one person every, uh, this is from Oxfam, one person every four seconds. Um, and so you look at that and you say, wow, like there's this traditional world of uh, money, media and market, uh, rather my, uh, money, media, and maybe you can call it military. I think of it as the three M's, you know, um, the media markets and military. Um, it, and, and we have a certain kind of cocoon, but there are so many problems in the world that cannot be solved by those forces. And so we said, oh, how do we look at our infrastructure and start addressing some of those? Um, and so we do a whole slew of projects. I mean, you can imagine over 20 years, but the most recent one that I'm very excited about is a peer learning platform um, that's called Pods. Uh, it's, it's just Pods and you're in the pandemic. This is post pandemic. And we said, how do, you, how do we learn from each other? What is the architecture for that? We would do it offline. We would do all these retreats all around the world um, in offline settings. And it was really powerful where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Like the whole purpose is not to be transactional and to consume content, but to come together in an arrangement where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Like those flock of starlings that you see where it's, it's, it's not what the individual does. It's not what like a small subset does. It's like what the whole is doing, you know? So that one plus one is greater than two kind of a thing. And how do we, you know, how, how do we tap into that? Um, and so we have this very unique uh, pod platform and there are these pods. And so, yeah, you can check out servicebase.org. I would say, what uh, you know, at, at, as an everyday hero, like if you want a little bit of good news, you can go to dailygood.org or go to coronavirus. That's another thing that came up in the pandemic. We said everyone is responding out of fear. How do you respond out of compassion? How do you respond to suffering, not out of fear, but out of compassion? And so coronavirus, it's a play on corona, uh, where responses of compassion, and there's like, I think over 5,000 stories of news stories, everyday new stuff coming up. Um, so yeah, you, you, can, you can subscribe to that, check it out. There's all these pods um, that are happening. And so it's a, there's, a, there's a lot there. It's hard to sound bite it, but its principle is rooted in the small. I often say we've never started a project. And people were like, what? And I said, we haven't. We just listen to the emergence. And, you know, if, if all, everyone is there in a circle and you look at and you say, well, what is that whole telling us? And you just follow that lead. And so it's been that kind of a process. It's a very humble place to be. It's like, yeah, you know, we, we did our lemonade stand and that led to this and that led to this and that led to this. So yeah, you could create some uh, framing saying, yeah, yeah, we did all this and it's affecting all these people and all that. But I think the real answer is we're just like surrendering to the infinite 
to not even the infinite, to the hem. I, one of our friends has a beautiful phrase. She says, the hem of the infinite. Like, it's just like, you know, man, infinite, you can't even fathom. We're just, uh, we're making humble offerings to the hem of the infinite with this kind of heart uh, to be empty instruments. And it's very powerful when you do it with other people. Uh, and you and and you create this web of affinities that benefits you and benefits the world and you know at some larger level you may not even deeply know how it's benefiting the world but you don't need to know that's not a question that arises in your mind because there's you know capitalism you're talking about capitalism there's a karmic capitalism that comes in too right so it's like letting go of all of those concepts and just like breathing into the now and 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 just offering i think it's just a blessed way to be yeah i think it's uh hard to even talk about what's uh, outside capitalism because uh because the questions we would ask are kind of inside the framework as well so everything i hear you say is kind of taking it out of that framework in a way that it doesn't even make sense to talk about it within it. Um, well, uh, so this uh, officially concludes our event. Uh, we are uh, so grateful that you agreed to do this event with us, Nipun. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I hope people uh, enjoyed it and uh, got something out of it or nothing, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I should say. <laughs> I don't know if that's too transactional. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I just wanted to quickly mention that uh, DRBU will be having, we have an upcoming event. Um, maybe Brenda can say a few words about it and then we'll close. Yeah, we have an event coming up April 21st. It's going to be an event with one of our professors here at DRBU, um, Professor Doug Powers. It's going to be, we titled the event Enlightenment and the Metaverse? Question mark, Freedom, Buddhism, and Virtual Reality. So just kind of a another kind of conversation with Doug on the future of technology and also just questions about freedom and what reality really is, especially with all these new virtual reality things coming out. So. I'll just put the link in the chat box in case people are interested in any of those future events. Um, but I mean, it sounds like a lot of people also would love to have another event with Nipun in the future. It seems like one hour is not quite enough. Um, there's just so much I feel like we can learn from you and just like, I don't know, I always feel like spending time in your field kind of is like, there's something just um, nourishing about that. So I feel very grateful to have been able to spend some time in that this evening. We can, uh, next event can be six hours with Nipun. Yeah. <laughs> just follow, follow Nipun around for 24 hours. Well, I, you know, I, I, I feel the same way, actually, Brenda, what you just articulated, I think it was beautiful, just being in that field. Mm -hmm. That, you know, even uh, we hosted a pod with some monks from CTTB. Uh, on noble friendships, so it was very profound. And I, next time they host it again, I would I hope that all of you uh, engage with it because it's just there's very the Buddha said very clearly that like the only thing that matters on the path is noble friendship, um, and yet like there's very little we understand about it. But the crux of it was that you go from a me to me connection to a we to we connection to a us connection, right? That it's a me to me is, you know, my identity and your identity. We to we is me and all of mine and that all the things I bring and you and all the things you bring and all of that coming together. But even that has a limitation, even that can create an identity. And so ultimately, it's just a us connection, at which point the four Brahma Viharas, particularly compassion, just continues to flow through you, you know, and it's just a blessing. It just blesses. You don't even know who's blessing who in which direction but you just feel like reverent and you just feel like bowing to the ground and offering your thanks and saying, man, what a joy. And so I think we come together. I know Brenda and Omar have put this together with that kind of intention, you know, and, and when you do that, it's a real blessing. So it's a blessing for me. And I think it's a blessing. Uh, you guys have blessed us. Um, and certainly most, most certainly you've blessed me. So thank you for the opportunity.
Okay, so maybe uh, if people want to unmute just for a second and say goodbye, and then we can uh, end for the night. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Bye. 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 Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Brenda and Omar. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye. This was definitely inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Kisses. Kisses. Please come yeah. again. We'll be waiting. <laughs> Very good.